Thank you, Brian. Great stuff. I'm pretty excited to be able to be working on a team that will be working directly with Brian, et cetera, because we are in the Vice Provost's office. Uh, my name is Ed Johnson. I've been here at Regis for about a year. I spent the previous six years just sort of developing my skills kind of on my own to build analytics, to build websites, to build uh, new tools for figuring out what's in students' heads. I absolutely love it, and uh, it's been great to be a part of this uh, Regis IDNT team, um, which I'll tell you a little bit about as part of part one in the plan of a talk. It's going to be a quick overview of IDNT. I'm going to tell you how I go out and I pull data out of our LMS so that we can start actually providing actionable or at least interesting information. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what we have done and are going to be doing with the data. And uh, if there's time, I'm going to throw out a couple of things that I've found anecdotally to be helpful uh, for making sure that we have good data and that we're able to use that data. Sorry. So uh, here with the overview, I don't know, I'm guessing most of you guys probably know a little bit about us, but like I said, we're under the Vice Provost's office. Uh, we're separate from ITS, that's the problem you have, is letting our constituents know, don't call ITS, if you need help with the board, <laughs> depending on the type of help. Uh, and uh, let's see, we, we tend to work directly with, you know, ITS, like if we have problems, we go to them, they are more in charge of making sure that the learning management system's up and running, they're in charge of making sure that our network's up and running. Uh, they, they really do a lot to make our job easier so that we can just focus on uh, learning design as well as any sort of analytics that we want to pull out. Uh, people that we like work for, you could say, like the dean wants to see their CSS change across their college, they can come to us. If uh, any of our content developers are looking for new tools uh, or training with those new tools, they'll come to us. And uh, same constructive. So those are that's where we are in the university, in the vice provost office, and these are who we work for. Now, how do we get our data out of the LMS? Uh, well, we have two different options. I've got a question mark on pay here because I'm still not 100% sure which one of these other products from E2L are free, and I also think that some of those are changing. Uh, I just heard the name of Brightspace Data Platform is going to be free to access, but I have not yet accessed it, so I can't say for sure. Uh, most of what I do, in fact, really all of what I do is just use the D2L Valence API. Anybody here heard of the D2L Valence API? Does anybody know what an API is? <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically just like a computer version of your finger. I'm like, so I could click on a button, and that would send a signal to the LMS to show me a web page, or with an API, I can use a programmatical interface to just connect to D2L. It's not really magic, it's just a uh, set of your finger, it's a program, talking to D2L. And I can talk to it really quickly, and go to a lot of pages really fast, and pull patterns out of those pages really quickly. So that's my basic description of an API. Uh, a little more, uh, just to wow you briefly. We use a software development kit based on PHP to make restful calls through an HTML and JavaScript uh, interface. If we want to get files, we have to use the curl library to make web dev connections uh, to our little file structure. And then we take all of that data and we put it in MySQL database. Pretty easy stuff. Yeah, if you've uh, picked up seven or so computer languages over the years, then you can just connect this stuff and fly right through. Uh, it's pretty fun. Hey, uh, I don't know if your uh, development team doesn't have PHP. Uh, D2L does a pretty great job of making software development kits in a, a range of different languages. Node, C++, C Sharp, all the different things. Uh, so, and, you know, I mean, it's free, and it's just, it's right there. And if you're already relatively familiar with the structure of the LMS, it should make sense how you make your little software development kit connect to and pull information from that LMS. If you did a great job. Any just quick clarifications about an API or this particular API? What are we doing with the data? The first thing is something that I would consider to be uh, a, a general, like, best practice. We're just figuring out what uh, what our 
teachers are doing inside of the LMS. You know, if, uh, if we were thinking about migrating to a new LMS, and that new LMS doesn't have discussions for some reason, obviously a terrible example because they all do, uh, then we're going to be like, no, that's bad. Because here at uh, Regis, almost every single class has discussions. Next up in popularity is going to be the Dropbox uh, assignment submission. And uh, that's about it. Right? So this, this helps us to know if we ever want to do uh, migrate. So we got to at least have those two pieces if we want existing knowledge base to transfer really quickly. Uh, we are doing some course content analysis. So here, we're looking at everything from the accessibility <coughs> of our web pages to uh, you know, what links are teachers putting into their course. So we can, let's say if SurveyMonkey went down, we know which all courses have SurveyMonkey. Coming up in week four, Right, so we can jump in there. We can go to just those 20 uh, specific web pages with inside of the E2L. Give them a new uh, survey link. No problem for the students. Right, so the ability to just dive in, pour through whatever tens of thousands of documents ends up really saving us a lot of time and improves the experience for students. Uh, my opening words were to it more to expanding our data map. That's uh, something. That I mean, I'm really just wrapping my mind around what all we actually can access inside of D2L. And further, even after you've used all of the basic queries and figured out, like, this tells me how many discussion posts were made, then you can start diving in and say, oh my gosh, I have four years of data from this student making posts in the discussion. I can run some, you know, natural language processing kind of stuff to figure out if it appears that Regis education gives them a better vocabulary from the first time they made a discussion to the last time they made a discussion. Uh, yes, please. How far down can you drill into the gradebook? Uh, it depends so on how well uh, the granularity of the grade items themselves. Mm -hmm. So like if a, a professor just said, I have a numeric grade item that is just 100 points and it's based on the total score in the quiz, that's as far as I can go. Uh, if they have individual grade items for every question within a quiz, then I can get those. I don't even have to go that far. Okay. My question is really, um, can you pull and see who is using the gradebook and who has entered, entered grades lately? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Help more. <laughs> okay. <Please. laughs> uh, sweet. That's. Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit more focused on my next slide. Okay. Cool. Um, but it's really. All right, so expanding our data map, just figuring out what we got, uh, <coughs> what else we could unpack, and then uh, negotiating who gets what. So like, it's pretty great. It's like, oh, hey, now we know how accessible each course is. But if we tell our deans that, maybe they're going to react in a way that isn't super positive for the teachers. So you know, do we tell the individual teachers, hey, here's your current accessibility score? Do we tell uh, the legal team at Regis, hey, we have some accessibility stuff. So at this point, we've really only just done like a tiny proof of concept to make sure that we can test the accessibility for anyone. <coughs> and we're in the process of negotiating what we're going to do with more data that would come from running it through the entire see here. When, when you look at Ed's getting ready, I, I just have to share that every, every other day, Ed would come into my office with this goofy, silly grin and say, hey, guess what I can do? And then he shows me this absolutely amazing, phenomenal way of getting another piece of uh, very specific data from this massive amount of data we have right now. This is absolutely amazing stuff. Which Appreciate that. And Canvas does actually have a good API. I think it might be a slight notch ahead of one of the D2L offers. Uh, 
They're very similar. They're both RESTful, so you basically are just sending a URL request. So the individual tools, definitely get to those here shortly. Uh, our, our broad plans with the data, of course, just improving user experience. So if we go in and we make a CSS change so that now all the buttons are bigger, if we see that students are able to find what they're looking for more quickly, boom, we've improved their experience. If it's taking them less time to navigate from the calendar that tells them they have to do a thing to the discussion that they have to participate in, boom, we've done our job. Uh, I believe that that will start improving educational outcomes. Now, certainly that data is already available to uh, UAR uh, because all grades come out of the LMS and go somewhere else. But we can get in there by uh, just looking at everything from, you know, does it interaction with the discussion improve what's going on for you? Does uh, the clarity with which the information is provided improve educational outcomes? Overall, we're just going to be looking at small grain, medium grain, large grain sizes for how we have or have not impacted uh, educational outcomes with choices from you know, instructional design to the actual like layout of the course. Uh, we're hoping to support education research. I mean, we certainly have a lot of data now. Uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to jump into that realm, uh, support teachers who are looking to get uh, themselves involved with education research. You know, if they need data about the change that they made and how that impacted any aspect of student learning or interaction, we want to be able to support that. Those are, those are our broad goals. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, fun little side ideas that I also want to do with the data. Like I mentioned, just that analysis of discussion quality over time, and many other things. But I know that we, we are short on time, so I'm going to run through some of this stuff. Some of the things that I'll mention here, you will have control over. Some of them you might not. Uh, I've been very lucky to walk into a place where uh, departmental data choices have already been made that are really helpful for me. We have strong interdepartmental ties. The Instructional Design and Technology team has been working with colleges around this university for a while and doing a great job letting them know that we're here to serve them and, and that uh, we're good at our job. And so if I need to see the new uh, course codes that are coming up in our business college, it's like changing its structure, I can just call them up and they will give me that information. And now I can start restructuring my data ahead of time so that when the next semester comes, I can print them out a report that makes sense to them. Uh, let's see, support from above, Vice Provost's office, loves data. This makes it so easy for us. I can spend some of my time on data because my department knows that that's what is wanted from our boss. And if we need to, we can be like, hey, can you send us that data? No, put the provost said. Right? <laughs> and then we get our data. It's great. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And so then the other departmental data choice is to get a data wrangler. In your IDMT, you don't have somebody like me, you should get a me. <laughs> Procedural data choices. Other stuff that was really handled already before I got here is keeping the old data. Uh, Joyce's LMS ITS team has made sure that inside of our D2O, we have from all the way back to the end of 2011, a bunch of course data. Now, if you are just getting started with a, like a data and analysis plan, it is so helpful to be able to play with old data to see like here's the structure. Here's an actual example, not just like, here's the query that I could ask something for. Here is the query that I can ask, all the data that I would get, I can parse its structure, and I can really just be ready for when the next semester comes up, and we need to start making actionable choices. Map all of the available data. Figure out what you've got. Just looking at what's available, at least for me, it just really starts inspiring like connections. And, and ways to change uh, daily practice inside of a classroom so that a little more data comes out of it. Like if you're doing video, but you're not collecting interaction data on that video, maybe host it somewhere else. If you don't have uh, you know, interactive questions going on throughout the video, you can't really tell if students are tracking and understanding. So when, when I see that we are missing all sorts of interactive 
uh, data, but we could get it. Uh, ask for more data. A lot of uh, learning management systems won't share with you the server log. This is a thing that tells you every time a student clicked anywhere. That is so helpful. Oh my gosh. I mean, like, this is something that all businesses use if they want to know like how are people using you know Amazon.com, how are they finding the right things? You have to do click analysis. And it's very useful inside of uh, learning management systems too. So if you don't have it, ask for it. Uh, then once you've kind of mapped out your data, started collecting some bits and pieces, it's usually going to be in a lot of different formats. And so my personal preference is just to put everything into a MySQL database. Make it so that you can run in one second, you know, a report on all the discussions that have happened over the last four years. It's great. It speeds it up. It makes it easy to understand a little bit. And then makes it easy so that if we need to transfer in anything over to UAR, we have it in a format that we like, don't have to start from scratch explaining it. It makes sense. Right. So course design, yeah, so engagement. That's, if you want more data, you have to have engaging content. You know, uh, one of those leading factors for success was student logins to a course. If your uh, uh, LMS course has only a syllabus in it and doesn't have a single discussion and doesn't have, you know, uh, a quiz that you have to take, the only reason you have to go to the LMS as a student is to read a syllabus. And I report to him, hey, we only have one login for this entire semester from that student. Their model is going to say, this kid's in trouble. The kid's not in trouble. Login data isn't login data. It's not all the same. If you have a class that has a lot more engagement happening, you're going to be able to tell more finely grained as a student is going to fail. Same with the feedback. If you're trying to understand you know, what's going on in a classroom, you really need feedback from the professors. And whether they're participating in a discussion or they're using a rubric, this additional feedback is very useful for making any kinds of decisions about uh, content design. Uh, one of my favorite examples is just if I have a multiple choice question that was through research built so it really nice distractors, so I've got four total answers I could choose from, three distractors and one right answer, and all I record is right or wrong. My feedback isn't as rich as it could be. You know, but if I have feedback that's explicitly tailored to each one of those distractor questions, now I can say, oh, it looks like when this teacher teaches this content, students always end up falling for this distractor. And that's just that's actionable data. If you want to scaffold actionable data, Better the feedback, better your data. Other design choices, uh, PDFs are pretty uh, obfuscated from most of the analyses, at least that I'm capable of doing. HTML is really easy to scrape. You know, if I want to see what are the heading structures, what is the actual text inside of a document, I can do that really easily with HTML, and I'll do that with PDF. Can't do that with flash content. So wherever possible, HTML, please use HTML. The data people will love you. Uh, accessibility ends up, you know, having positive impact on our ability to collect data. You know, I mean, uh, from just that earlier example, the heading structures, that's something that supports accessibility. And it helps me as a data analyst because it provides a semantic uh, layout for the page. I know where the different sections of the page are. It's good for accessibility, it's good for data. What was good for learning is good for data. Additional engagement, and good feedback. And then uh, the final point here about uh, good course design data choices would be the uh, use of the LMS whenever possible. If it already has a discussion board, please don't go out and use another discussion board. That data's gone. You know, now I can't. I... But what if the outside discussion board is more engaging? than the discussion board inside the LMS. And what if there's other platforms that have features that the LMS doesn't have? That's a great question. I would hope that they also have a feature of being able to collect that data and send it back to the LMS so that we can still analyze it. Um, oftentimes, 
a very standard mm, product inside of an LMS can be punched up so that it now has those other features. So if you find that there are for any one sub product of your LMS out there, see what you can do to enhance your version of it. Change the CSS on your discussion boards, but it's easier to read. You know, uh, I, I do a lot of um, hacking of our <laughs> learning management system so that now our professors can add interactive content instead of just like writing out a sentence. I can turn that sentence into uh, you know everything from just like a tab interface so that students have to tab around to something that moves when they're trying to click on like mm, not the greatest description there but basically you can try to enhance your existing learning management system you don't have to just wait for outside products to come in and steal all your data you can find ways to keep people in the native setup so they can use data uh, all right yeah, you know, make sure you have all these basics. Uh, obviously, as an IDNG team, it's good for us to know how many students there are, where those students are. If I want to do any kind of reports about how's the business college doing, you know, with uh, increasing student engagement, you know how many students there are and how to find them in the system. Anything that goes into an LMS from a teacher or a student, you should have that. If you don't have that, complain to your LMS. You know, uh, if teachers and students are interacting with your LMS and you don't have that data, you have to pay them to find out if somebody clicked, complain, and then maybe bam, so you have the data. Uh, and that, that, that server log thing, I just love it. It, just, it gives you so much information about like what, what devices students are using. You know, if you're trying to say that uh, everybody is logging into the system using uh, their, their phone, you can actually prove that with the server log or find out that that's not the case. So those are basic data stuff. Uh, I guess that's all I had. Whew, sorry, I just speed through there. Any quick questions for me about, hey, we have this data and we don't know what to do with it, or hey, where do I find this, or hey, can we eat lunch yet? Or, great, I'll just assume I, what, what, what? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so, do you, do you guys have a web app um, to access the API? Or how did you build that? Was it built in house? Uh, we started with a basic structure provided by D2L. They have a software development kit that basically just handles all the authentication stuff and gives you one example of how to structure like a Git request. Uh, from there, everything else is completely custom. Uh, I'm actually pretty happy with uh, the stuff that we built, although at this point it is still pretty much like uh, something that only a developer can use. We're working towards making it more just like broadly user friendly. Uh, but yeah, at, at this time, like I just write a couple pages of code, hit run, and then it scrapes information out of the LMS and puts it into a database for me. Uh, have started building a couple of visualizations. So, you know, I mean, for the most part, data from the past six years isn't going to change, right? And so I can just set up some standard graphs. Teachers just, or deans or whoever, just click between the different semesters, and they can see whether there was an increase or decrease in employees. Uh, but yeah, at this point, it's mostly custom built on top of the software development. How do you actively engage with instructional designers and faculty to use this? Right. Uh, well, again, I mean, like, because of the great uh, relationships that IDNT already has around the university, the policy has been pretty easy. Uh, once they found out that we had started tapping into the LMS, different data managers, etc., from the other colleges have reached out periodically and been like, "Can you do this? Can you find this?" Uh, when Say we're scanning through all of the content and we see a bunch of flash content, we know that that's a problem because it's not particularly accessible. It doesn't work across all different platforms. In some cases, it just, it just doesn't work. So we will either uh, just go ahead and change it from flash to HTML5 without telling anybody, 
or we'll reach out to them, you know, be like, hey, this is something that we know is a problem, and so forth, I think, uh, listening pretty quickly. Um, were there other parts of that question that you would like to have answered? Okay, so when we know um, data that it looks like something's true, is there a gap somewhere? I mean, we uh, haven't been doing this for very long yet, so we don't have like a lot of standard operating procedure. Uh, if we see something that is a college-wide problem, where like the CSS in, say, the business school is just terrible, then we would try to reach out to you know, content developers or, or you know, closer to like the dean level, because that's like a change that is going to impact a lot of people. Uh, if we see just individual courses where there's trouble, and we already have a relationship with those instructors, then we'll reach out to them. But um, no standard operating procedures, mostly just trying to utilize our relationships and our data as it happens. Yeah, let me also add, I think there's already written this, this can be a sensitive area. If you have an issue in a course or courses and we identify it, we see it, and we're just not quite sure who to go to, do you go to level and get you know, instructors, developers, uh, faculty developers, and or do you work with the faculty? It's, it's a sensitive area. And, and what I think what we said is this is new to us. We just started this to us. And these are some of the questions. I mean, it's all about student success, but it's not that we have to see you all over uh, faculty and all of these. My question is the procedural, so maybe you're not here yet, but is there any kind of mechanism that you say, all right, we have a, a rotating system that we're going to look at this college or these courses or have kind of a monitoring system? For example, at our university every Thursday, we have people going in and looking at data looking for um, long and so kind of a, a short list of things. But you could have a major problem happening, but how regularly might you have exposure to that? Or you kind of like let the data emerge and then red flags pop out? Or uh, is there any structure or system currently in place that you can systematically assess different components of different courses at different colleges, different levels? What does that look like? We don't have that yet. Uh, it's definitely something we're working towards, uh, some sort of like actionable live dashboards. For the most part, the main progress we've made is just in uh, figuring out all of the data that is available and start like creating baseline reports from that that will help us see if there are any changes like from the norm within any one college. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the data that comes out of this valence API is more useful for what happened last semester than it is what's happening right now. But definitely possible to put in place things that would look for, you know, a sudden change in logging frequency. Uh, we definitely could do that. We definitely have not. Well, thanks, guys, for coming and listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here. Probably stick around for free food, too. <laughs>